Now, the luxury of being a teacher is sometimes you can deviate from the script, uh, and I'm going to take that opportunity this morning. Uh, it will be six more years before October the 17th, today, falls on a Sunday. So I want to share with you all a personal story that took place on a Sunday, October the 17th, 56 years ago, 1965. 56 years ago today, my mother, 35 years old, woke me up, her 13-year-old only child, as she was about to leave for the hospital to deliver her long-awaited second child. She gave instructions to get ready for church and a friend would pick me up for Sunday school. We never missed. Then to come home and wait. As I walked her to the front porch on that October morning, which was so bright and clear as we're experiencing today, she turned and looked at me and said, now Chip, you be good, as she turned and walked away. Several year, hours later, early that afternoon, I heard cars arrived and opened the door, only to see my dad sobbing as people around him from the church were standing by, nearby, and all he could utter was, your mother died. She had died of a heart attack holding my little baby brother. Now I tell you this story, one, in memory of her, but more importantly, to remind us the precious nature of today. History is behind us. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. And they refer to today as a gift. That's the reason they call it a present. We need to appreciate and enjoy and rejoice in each and every day the Lord gives us. We see in Psalms chapter 118, verses 22 to 24, it says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Of anybody in the whole world that's got more to be happy about, more to rejoice about, it would be us. We have a hope of eternal salvation. We have a life here within this congregation, within his church, within his body. Okay? We live in America, and we live in Texas. Okay? Now, is that a trifecta? Does that work for everybody? Okay, so if we have any reason to be happy and to rejoice, it is us here today. So let's invigorate ourselves. Let's, let's enjoy every ounce of every minute of every day that God gives us. Now, we're going to go to our lesson. How many people are in here on Wednesday night and hear Mike's lessons? Okay, in 1 Peter. Okay. Now, what we're seeing in 1 Peter, he is writing to a totally different group of people. He's writing to people that are scattered throughout Asia. But what do we see him writing in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9? Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because of this, you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Different apostle, different audience, same ad admiration, right? So what are we seeing? It's not just the uh, Christians that are in Corinth that were arguing among themselves and disagreeing among themselves and not cooperating among themselves and not unifying among themselves. We see this scattered throughout a lot of the churches, let's just say most of the churches, okay, of the first century. Now, as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we see that he's focusing on the fact that they are taking each other to court. 
Now, in the Roman government, well, let's, first of all, let's talk about the, the Jewish way of handling differences is with to go to the synagogue and handle the differences there with the priest, and then he would sort things out. Remember when they were trying to take Jesus to trial? They took him first to the Jewish ministers or administrators, okay? And then when they wanted to put him to death, they couldn't do that. And they had to take him to a Roman court in order to be able to do that. And the Roman court's attitude was, hey, what's that? That's between you guys. That's not between us. So they didn't want to get into the Jewish business, the Jewish people's business. Now what we find in Corinth is we find the church is made up of a lot of Gentiles, some Jews. And so therefore they're used to taking their differences to court. And the Roman government had a really neat type of court system. Anybody for any reason could take anybody they wanted to to court. You would go to the court system, you would say what case you had, they would assign you a magistrate, but the accuser, let's just say for a second, I was accusing Roy of owing me $100, and so therefore I wanted to take him to court. I would have to put up $100, and Roy would have to put up $100. Then we would explain ourselves to the magistrate. If I lost, the government got my $100, and if Roy lost, I got his $100. And that was the way they were settling differences among themselves. And Paul is saying, hey, guys, just because you've been used to this and just because it's available to you, that is the last thing in the world you need to be doing. Why? If it's freely available and people were doing it, why would Paul encourage insist or encourage them not to take what is their normal civil legal course of action. Don't shake your dirty laundry out in front of the world. Because we're trying to be a testimony to the world, right? We're trying to be a Christian example to the world. We're trying to show the world that we've got something that's unique. It's referred to as the peace that surpasses what? All understanding. What does that mean? That means we don't understand it, right? It's something that's so unique about our relationship with God and our relationship with each other that it's beyond description. And so therefore, when we take these petty differences out into the world, it hurts our testimony, doesn't it? It, it hurts bad because we're saying there's no one among believers who, who uh, handle the truth of some great way. So we don't go to an unbelieving world to handle our, our differences as Christians. Don't do that. No. You know, and he... he, he, he you pick this up in the first chapter where they were arguing among themselves. Now you've, you've passed the idea of a petty argument of which preacher do you, do you really adhere to over to what you refer to as a more concrete uh, type of argument. But nonetheless, one, you shouldn't be doing it. And number two, you definitely shouldn't be taking it outside the church. Yeah. That's right. All right. Roy's referring to a, a, this has been 20 plus years ago or longer, okay, where, where a church of Christ was taken to, to court, okay, in regards to how they handle church discipline. And we discussed church discipline last week, okay. Is, is God in for church discipline? Yes. If there's sin in the church, we shouldn't wink at sin. We shouldn't turn a blind eye towards sin. And how should we approach that person that is sinning? With love and with tenderness and any type of action we might take toward them has got one goal in mind, restoration, not alienation, right? 
Sometimes we are trying to take on alienation instead of restoration. The sole purpose behind anybody ever doing anything toward a church uh, action is to, one, condemn the sin, but you're not condemning the sinner, in hopes that that person will repent from their sin, turn away from it, not repeat it. We always think of it's repeating sin. No, it's repentance from sin, turning away from that what we're trying to do in the church discipline. But what we're seeing here is people stepping outside the church, okay, attempting to try to get the world involved in something. Now, again, we've discussed this before. Are there instructions in Matthew in regards to how we're supposed to handle things among ourselves? Absolutely. Is it difficult? Yes, because it says, if I've got a problem with you, what am I supposed to do? Go to you. We have a tendency to go to everybody else but, don't we? But just think about it. If we would do what Matthew chapter 18 tells us to do, and so therefore every time I might possibly have a problem with Jakey, instead of me telling Roy about it, I'm supposed to tell Jakey about it. What is that going to make me toward Jakey? More tolerant, right? Why? Because all these little things that irritate me, if I have to say something to him about it, I'm going to do what? I'm going to be a lot more accepting. I'm going to be a lot more tolerant. Why? Because I don't want to have to go. So therefore, I'm going to have a wider tolerance band. But us that don't have to go anywhere, but to get on the phone or to tell somebody in a whispering ear or worse, Facebook, okay, you know, you know where we air differences, okay, that would change all that, wouldn't it? That's what God wants. God wants us to go to someone, to have that discussion directly with them for two things. One, it'll make us more tolerant of that person because we don't really want to do that. And second, it solves the problem quicker, right? Versus something escalating over time. That's another reason why he tells us not to let the sun go down on our wrath. That's another reason why he tells us to be forgiving of one another. Because the person that you haven't forgiven isn't suffering on the fact that you haven't forgiven them. You're the one that's suffering. That's right. But see, step two of chapter 18 of Matthew is, if you're not successful, go with someone else. Now, let's think about this stock. Okay, I've got a problem with Jakey. I've gone to Jakey. It's still unresolved. Now I've got to convince Freddie to go with me to Jakey. That means I've got to convince J J Freddie that i got a problem with Jakey. He may not buy that argument, right? And so therefore, I can't get Freddie to go, so I go to Mike. Now, or I, I'll go back to Roy, or I'll go someplace else to try to find a, another person that will go with me to air this differences with Jakey. What's that open up right there? Because this person you're trying to coerce into going to Jakey don't have any idea what you're talking about. But, and, and he's not necessarily siding with you. It may be your opinion but your opinion may not be shared by that second person. Okay. So therefore, it ups the ante in regards to how you're dealing with this person because you've got to get somebody else that agrees with you that's willing to go with you to this accused person. Does that make a lot of possibilities that differences would be aired out before you ever got there? Absolutely. That's when you're going to try to determine, one, it's not worth it. 
okay? Whatever kind of problems I might have are, is not worth the effort. Or two, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've looked at this thing long enough and I've tried to convince people long enough to the point that I really don't have a position against Jakey. And it dies right there. Okay. And then only after you've had people go with you and that person is still not repentant or, or come to compromise, then you, then you bring it up to the rest of the body. But what happens is we bring it up to the rest of the body before we ever tell the person. You know, so therefore they hear about the fact that we got a problem with them through the grapevine, not from us. And that's not what God's intended to do. All right, then as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to make uh, one reference to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But it lets you know kind of where Paul is headed in his discussions. It says, be careful, however that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. And as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, we're going to be talking about, uh, it reads, and that is some of you were, so he's talking about all the bad things that, and all the things that preceded that were sins of the people in, around them that some of you were, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So what's he talking about when he talks about that you were washed? What's his reference there? Baptism, okay. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. All right. So what is sanctified? What? Okay, you are growing to be more like Christ. Okay. Sanctified, justified. Are we justified by anything that we do? We're justified because of the blood of Jesus Christ that justifies us. We're sanctified. We've got a hope of eternal salvation. That's the reason that he's pounding home the fact that you Corinthians were lost in sin. And you did a number of bad things. And that's the reason he always refers to it as in the tense of were. You were sinning. But now you are sanctified. Okay. Now that we come up with the problem that they've posed, have you ever had a child give you a really weird explanation on why they ought to do something? And you go, have you really thought through that? Where we find the Corinthians is they're saying it's okay for fornication. We eat because we're hungry. We have sex because we have desire. And Paul's going, do what? Do what? I mean, how, how, how are those two related? And that's, the, what, that's, what he's, that's where he turns this corner here and he says, you know, just because it's appropriate or, or just because it's available to you, or maybe even just because it might be illegal, doesn't mean it's spiritually correct. Doesn't mean it's appropriate. Do sometimes we do that same thing in our own lives? Maybe not to the extent of fornication, but where we try to justify our sins. Well, we're only going to do it this one time. All right. You know, kids have excuses. Adults have reasons. Okay, right? Well, I've got a reason on why I'm doing this. Sometimes we call them white lies. Sometimes we call them, well, that's okay. Because we're not going to condemn our own sins, are we?
Are y'all tough on yourselves? Or are you, are you pretty well explain away your actions? Come on, guys. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, we're the world's worst about making excuses for our own actions. Why? Because that's human nature. We're never going to be wrong. We're never going to have done it wrong. We're always going to have an explanation of why we're doing things. You know, and we see this in our children, but we don't see it in ourselves. But at the same time, God, throughout the book, calls us children. Why does he call us children? Because we act like it, right? <laughs> okay. You know, we think that it doesn't pertain to us. It pertains to somebody else. It wasn't intended for us. It was intended for somebody else. Y'all slept on me last night. Come on, guys. Wake up. Yeah. Makes me wonder myself too. If I'm doing the sin, if I don't get to call him, I'm going to continue to do the sin. What you know, Roy's point is, we sin until we get caught. That's true. Sadly to say, many times we sin because we're ignorant of God's word. We're ignorant of what he requests of us. We're ignorant of what he demands of us. Now, is ignorance of the law any excuse? No. Try to explain that to a highway patrolman. Well, I didn't know. And he goes, oh, okay, then that's all right. Then I won't give you a ticket. I doubt it. Why? Because there were plenty of speed limit signs for you to observe what you're supposed to be doing. God's given us his word, so he's given us plenty of signs. Mike, on a regular basis, describes God's word to us and what those signs are in clear and distinct language. But yet we, we make a cognizant decision to do what? To not pay any attention to him. To go on about our merry way. Why do we do that? Because we're human. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mike. There's a question. Why do we routinely dismiss what God tells us to do and think it doesn't apply to us? Because that's what we want to do. Does what you want to do really matter? How many of you ever told your 16-year-old when they left for a date, just do what you want to do? That doesn't work real well, does it? Why? Because nature and what they might naturally want to do may not be the appropriate thing to do, right? 
So that's the last thing that God's going to tell us to do is to say, that's all right. It's okay. None of you would take a pair of scissors and go into your Bible and selectively cut out scriptures that you don't like. But we mentally do it, don't we? We read along and we, amen, amen, uh-oh, amen, and, and we, we, we agree to certain scriptures, but we don't agree to all the scriptures. Can you do that? Can you buy part of the package and not all the package? Either God's word is God's word, and God meant what he said, and he said what he meant, and he says it in such a clear and distinct manner to the point that all of us can understand. We don't need someone to read the Bible for us and to explain it to us. If we would just read it for ourselves, it'll explain itself. But we have a tendency, one, not to read it because of what it says. And when we do read it, we argue with it. You ever had your kid argue with you? Yeah. Were they right? Absolutely. In their own eyes. In their own mind. One of the worst scriptures that has ever in the Bible was they thought in their own mind. Or the word they drifted. Isn't that scary? Just because you think it in your own mind, just because you fabricated, fabricated this imaginary premise that you're okay, how does that stand up in the day of judgment? Yes. question is asking for forgiveness. My concern is we're so, I think pig-headed is a good word, hard-headed, you know, that we want to argue with God on whether that's really a sin at all. So therefore, the last thing we're going to do is to ask God to forgive us of something that we're not going to own up the fact that we did, all right? So we're asking for forgiveness when we've actually jumped over the chasm that I'm talking about this morning, and that is making excuses for our actions and therefore not adhering to God's instruction and so therefore thinking that we're right and making a stand that we're right against who? Who are you making a stand against? God Almighty, the judge. And you're fabricating some case before the judge that will judge you for eternity? Well, I'm picking an argument with him. 
Is that the, really the guy you want to argue with? The ultimate authority that laid out his rules and his regulations, and we want to pick a fight with him? I don't think so. He's already said he won, right? He's already said the devil and his angels and all those that follow him were cast into a lake of fire that he prepared for the devil and his angels, not for us. So the last thing in the world we want to do is pick an argument with God. But oftentimes we do because our argument is, I don't believe what you said or I'm not going to do what you instructed. That's the argument. We may not verbalize it, but we sure live it. And that's where he's focusing on here with the Corinthian church is that they have drifted into sin. And this is a particular sin of fornication. Why? Because they had been doing it before they became Christians. And so therefore, it was a natural thing that they had been doing and that they carried over to the point after they become Christians. And Paul's saying, whoa, this isn't your body. You are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember a few weeks ago we discussed the Holy Spirit? And this is a hard concept, particularly for those that were raised Jewish, okay, and these Gentiles that were coming into the, earth, uh, into the church, that once they were baptized for the remission of their sins, they got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And one of the questions we asked ourselves a couple of weeks ago, if you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you today, it's the same as if you had Jesus standing beside you today. What would you do in the presence of Jesus? Where would you take Jesus? What kind of thoughts would you have with Jesus? Why not say thoughts? Why? Jesus knows what? Our thoughts. The intent of our heart. We around here right now, we see your physical being, and we see that you're present today, and we think certain things about you because of your presence today, but we don't know your heart. You could be here under real duress, okay, and wishing you were anyplace else but here, okay, but we don't know. But I think we lose sight of the fact that we're carrying the Holy Spirit around with us. And he sees our thoughts. He sees our intent of our heart. He sees our actions. And yet we drag him along with us. Well, if we were more cognizant of the fact that he was actually with us, I think we would stop some of the things we do. The devil's real stout, and the devil knows us better than we know ourselves. But the important thing here is the Holy Spirit is there for a reason. He's referred to as the comforter. He's co referred to as the helper. He's referred to as the interceder. He's there for you. You couldn't ask for a better advocate. When Jesus said, I'm leaving you, and I'm leaving someone, I'm, I'm, to allow someone greater than me to be able to come. So that's Jesus' attitude toward the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit can be everywhere. While well, Jesus couldn't. Jesus was, was confined to be one place at one time. But, and he said, this is my deposit that I'm going to come back. Now, if he left a deposit... He's going to come pick it up, right? If you're going to be shopping for a piece of furniture and they said, okay, it's going to take a large deposit and you leave the deposit with Nebraska furniture or whatever, what's the chances are you're going to go back and pick up that piece of furniture? Highly probable. Why? Because they got a deposit, okay? 
That's what the Holy Spirit is. He is the encourager that lets us know that we have a home in heaven and God's not going to leave us. He's going to retrieve us. Isn't that great? All right. He doesn't leave. He retrieves. You know, and then, therefore, we have a home in heaven. Had a discussion this past week that talks about if our kids are studying Genesis in, in LTC and, and we talk about the creation of this beautiful world that we have and he did that in really five days because he created humans on the sixth day and he rested on the seventh. All right. Then Jesus says in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. All right. Well, that's been 20 200 years ago, right? When he said that, over 2,200 years ago, when he made that statement that's been recorded in, in John's gospel. Well, if he can create this beautiful world in six days, what do you think heaven looks like? If he's had 2,200 years to get prepared for us, that is the excitement that we have as Christians. That is the reason that we today can rejoice and be glad in it. Are there requirements? Absolutely. Are they laid out distinctly? Absolutely. Are they somewhat offensive to us against our sinful nature? Yes, because they're God's will versus the devil's will. So therefore, does he want us to follow his will? Every day. Is he always going to be there for us every day? Oh, is he going to pick us up when we stumble? Every time that we're willing to get up, he's willing to get us up. That's to get up. They say a, a prize fighter is a, is a winner that gets up more times than he gets knocked down. That's the difference between a winner and a loser. Okay. And the same thing with a Christian. Are we going to, are we going to get knocked down in life? All the time, okay? <laughs> because we've got sin full nature, and he's still alive and well in our life. All right? But it's how you treat the Holy Spirit, how you feed the Holy Spirit, studying his word, prayer, church attendance, communion, praise. That's how he feeds. That, 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 that's his feed sock. How do you feed the simple nature? Give in. Go along, okay? Not feed the Holy Spirit and therefore deprive him. Who's going to win in your life? The strongest one. The one that you feed, the one that you cater to, the one that you encourage is going to be the winning person in your life this next week. So I encourage you as you go out into this next week, read God's Word. That's the way he has the ability to talk to you. Pray. That's your ability to talk to him. Okay. And be cognizant that the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. So everywhere you go, he goes. Whatever you think, he hears. He's aware of. Your thoughts and intents. That should clean up some of our thoughts should clean up a lot of our direction, a lot, should clean up and make us have greater and purer thoughts because we know that he's in our heart and he's working with us each day. Thank you.